Uh, Masami sent me SCUM, scum, scissors for cutting up Mertzbell, double LP, in the mail in the early 80s. He got my address um, on 84 Eldridge Street in New York off the Confusionist sex record. Uh-huh. I didn't know what it was. Every once in a while, something would come to that address, like a, maybe a fan letter. Once in a while, like, I like your record. You know, it's just like, wow, you know, like somebody like, actually likes the record. That happened once in a while. It was very great. And then this package came from Japan. And it was this record. And I was like, oh, cool. You know, somebody sent me a record. And that happened once in a while, but this was pretty elaborate. And I didn't really think anything of it. I just thought it was very weird. And I, I, I don't recall really what I thought playing it. Like, I just probably um, was just like, I don't know what this is. This is very weird. And then uh, a couple of friends of mine who are big musicologist, record collector, Fricos, Jimmy Johnson at Forced Exposure Records, and Byron Coley, the music writer, had come to interview me uh, for Forced Exposure Magazine, and they saw that record. And they were like, "What? can we buy this record from you? And I was like, do you know this? I mean, what do you know about this? And they were like, oh, we want this record. You know, this is like, a, we've been looking for this forever. This is like the first record by this guy, uh, Mertzbaum. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, he just sent it to me in the mail, and and then I started thinking about it a little more seriously, like what this could be. And then when we first went to Japan in the, I guess the mid to late 80s, um, Masami was right there, like an emissary of just like, you know, uh, and he took me record shopping, and he pulled out like some of the compilation records that he was on really early on, and you know, presented them to me, and said, you should buy this, you should buy this. Um, and I uh, didn't really see Masami play, I don't think, until Japan, when we were there at the time. And it was right at the time when everybody was doing noise cassettes in Japan, like Vanilla Records, and, and um, people hanging out at um, the different record stores. And I wanted some of these people to play, and what I did is I asked every noise musician to play in, uh, in uh, Tokyo. And everybody came and, and it was like a noise cavalcade on stage, including Masami, Mertzbo. And there was no hierarchy at all going on. Everybody was kind of like, okay, you know, the Incapacitance guys, Mertzbo, Masana, um, except for Keiji Haino. He waited 10 minutes <laughs> and then he came out and took his cape off and made a grand entrance. But Merzbell was when he first came to play in New York City, I, I remember thinking um, I almost had this kind of discorporate feeling in my body that I had never experienced with any bands that sort of presented volume um, as a technique, be it Glenn Branca early on or be it Swans early on. This was completely otherworldly, where I literally had to sit down on the floor and just clutch my, my skull. And, and only can I could experience it that way, because it was in a very small space, and it was just this massive, crushing, kind of like, like voluminous like, uh, piece of sound. Um, and it was wonderful, but I remember almost physically, like, I couldn't handle it, you know, and I really needed to cover myself. And I've never had that experience ever. Or just, for, to participate in something where a musician is, who is so focused and kind of audacious doing that, you know. And you know Mertzmaz, he's very, he has a very solemn kind of, kind of a yeah, but, approach. Yeah, I mean, for, for me too, first time I heard it, I didn't even know who he was. Early 90s at yeah. Schulkingen in Stockholm. I had no idea who he was, what he was doing, anything. I was just there because I was there, it was like my, my living room. And I remember I was standing the, the like a studio, uh, one floor up, and you can look down in the in the, in the hall at, at Filking. Mm. There's a glass in between. And behind the glass, I was like starting, to, like to feel sick because it was so yeah. fucking loud. Not many people, but it was absolutely physical, absolutely. Yeah. I remember one guy sitting in the audience that I never seen at Filking before or after, smiling. Everyone else holding holding their skull or holding, trying to hold their bodies together. It was so fucking loud. Yeah. And I didn't know what to think. 
Yeah, from a musical at, perspective, at all. I was a like, little, like, like I was provoked, this? but at the same time very happy. Yeah, and I, I had really had to think about my feelings afterwards. I didn't know I didn't know how to handle this because yeah. I was for me I was so much into f- like acoustic free jazz. I was right. not at all into any kind of amplification shit. But that that changed everything in a way for me. Yeah. thing was going from town to town and immediately skipping sound check and going to the record store and pissing everybody off in the van because I'm at the record store and so that was historical um, I knew his some recordings that mass was on uh, with Barry Guy it was, was a specific CD with Barry Guy mm-hmm. that I really liked mm-hmm. and I had seen the name and a couple of people said oh have you heard Mats Gustafsson as far as like European improvised music and I was like yeah well, I've I've seen the name, and then I heard this one recording very guy. I was like, "Oh, this is great!" And I thought it was somebody from a European Scandinavian player who was like an older gentleman, you know, with like a, a beard and a saxophone and like glasses, and just like, you know, was, I'd like to know more about this Mats Gustafsson. So I go to Blue Tower Records in Stockholm, and then Hal, the proprietor, is there, and fin- amazing free jazz like a collection there and so I'm just like boom 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 and the good great jazz, modern jazz and old jazz and just everything I'm just like I'm there for like two hours and this kid who works there comes up to me and is just like oh and he's like pulling he's go taking me into the back and showing me Albert Eiler test pressings and acetates and I'm just like woo <laughs> and then I was like I, I need to get I need to get to the gig. I got sound check, and he's like, "Oh, I'll take you." And we get in the car, and uh, we're talking about music, music, jazz, jazz, jazz. And I was like, "You know, I'm look." He's like, "What are you looking for? Like, what are the specific Scandinavian records?" I was like, "Well, I'd like to find some records by 
this player named Mats Gustafsson. <laughs> and the driver of the car is like, starts laughing. I was like, well, I'm Mats Gustafsson. <laughs> it was this fucking guy. <laughs> was, and I was just like, I was just like, Really? <laughs> like, you know, I was like, the kid who worked in the record store was this guy whose records I was looking for. And so that was pretty funny. And then we, uh, so yeah, yeah I was just was like, you're Mouse awesome. yeah. And uh, so then I was like, <laughs> and then we started talking about records, records, and jazz. And, and uh, yeah, that's how we met. But then we did the duo, and it was just like, yeah, this is cool. It was just like a lot of sort of, um, a lot of referencing that was going on with our kind of musical uh, worlds that made sense to both of us. It quickly went into bad discoholic <laughs> manners, I would say. <laughs> I mean, in a way, I mean, it started with a duo, and in a way, the duo has always been there. Yeah. But it's been augmented with uh, Jim O'Rourke being in there, yeah. and there have been other people there. But it's all, in a way, there's always been the duo. That's the yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. did Original Silence, which yeah, yeah. Quintus was, was kind of a, an amazing project um, and then you know Mats would sort of be involved with uh, curating and East Odd uh, yeah yeah that and, was and huge. so there was a couple of, yeah. a couple of years there where all of Sonic Youth would come and we'd spend a solid week in East Odd and do different projects together and that was always good uh, there's always a connection with I mean records and with uh, yeah with images and, and Poetry and blah, it's, it, blah, it's, yeah. Yeah. it's, it's insane when we, when we meet because it's always like, ah, have you heard this, have you checked this out, like, bah, 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 bah. And, and music comes in a way, I mean, music is first in a way, but it, in another way it's like always last, you know, all the other shit comes first, but that's how it is.